to the writer's dream where authors can talk about how they write their books, how they publish their books, and how they market their books. We are on YouTube. You can find us there just to search my name, Linda Maria Frank, uh, and um, my Writer's Dream channel will come up, and you can look at about 125 interviews with different authors, many of them local. So if you're looking to get some tips about writing, if you're a budding author and you'd like to do that, or you're just looking for some good books written by some local authors, please visit the YouTube channel. We're also on Facebook. Uh, the page is called The Writer's Dream, imagine that. And um, many of the authors that are on the YouTube channel will be featured on The Writer's Dream. If you want to ask me a question or you would like to be on the show, please uh, email me. My email is my initials, lmf217 at hotmail.com. So we, I hope to hear from you. And today's guest is Dr. John Cron. And Dr. John Cron is the author of Living a Happier Life at Any Age and also Surviving to Thriving. So John, tell us, if, tell us something about yourself. Well, I am um, very much interested in churches since I'm a clergy and I'm very concerned today that churches of all denominations are hurting and some experts say that maybe as many as 30% of all churches will close in the next 10 years. So I work pretty much exclusively with trying to help churches turn around and uh, from just surviving to hopefully thriving. And I had written an earlier book, uh, From Surviving to Thriving, a Practical Guide to Revitalize Your Church, that's on Amazon. And uh, so then I thought, well, maybe not just churches and church leadership, but it might be well to put some things together that I've learned over a long life, a blessed long life, about how to live a happier life uh, at every age. So that sort of propelled me into writing the book that we're talking about today. Do you think that some of the um, defection from churches has to do with the internet? The fact that you can get more information on the internet than you used to be able to do. You can also see religious services on YouTube, you can see mm -hmm. them on television. Do you, do you think that's the only factor or do you think there are other things at play there? Well, if you look at the history of churches and through the centuries, it, it's sort of like this, up and down. And mm -hmm. in the 50s it was here and now it's here. And I think the trick is for churches to be able to, su to survive this valley until it'll pick up again. And so I think that's part of it. Yeah, the, re the reason why I ask you this question is not to diverge from the, from the book uh, Living a Happier Life, but I think a lot of people live a happier life when they're somehow connected either through a community in a church or, or through some belief system that enables them to feel yeah. that they are not alone. Um, I, I think that possibly this is just a thing, a thought I have, is that there's going to be a big rebirth in people wanting to find some sort of uh, spiritual um, sucker uh, in life simply because they're all disconnected now. I spent the weekend with some cousins of mine who I hardly ever see. One of them was constantly on the phone. <laughs> and I, I, I finally said to her, you really have a thing with that phone, don't you? And she said, yeah, I have to stop. I have to stop. So I think this, all this kind of internet stuff and whatnot and um, electronics probably will eventually lead to people losing their minds completely or, or finding another way to live. Well, I, I couldn't uh, agree with you more. And I think the next uh, edition of the book or the next book you and I should co-author all right. All right. And uh, the project. Good. <laughs> yeah. So, but there, there are many factors. Um, uh, church and going to church was sort of one of the basics for people. Mm -hmm. Now it goes into the, you know, like entertainment. And uh, you, you do it and you don't do it. It's not an essential thing to you do. But I do believe that uh, people really have a spiritual side to them and a spiritual self and an aspect of wonder. And uh, I don't think that a person can be a fully uh, happy person unless they do develop that, that aspect of their life. And 
people of faith are people that have an added dynamic. Uh, and a lot of that's uh, looked at in living a happier life at every age. The book is, is for people of faith. It also has a lot in it for people who are just looking, you know, mm -hmm. and to be able to say, okay, God, I really can't like this person. I can't love this person. They've hurt me. I can't forgive them. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to look at the cross of Christ and see to what extent God has loved and forgiven us and say, Christ, I need you to come into me in a way and do something through me that I can't do myself. And, you know, this is just one aspect of it. Yeah, well, I imagine that your experience in being a clergy has indicated to you sources of unhappiness. Probably there are patterns of unhappiness with people. Did that help you in Well, in I, I think some people have a lot that, that goes wrong. I mean, it's not fair. And, and they get a disproportionate amount of negative things happening in their lives. Mm. Uh, and people say, God, why me? Why is all this happening to me? And they lay it at God's footsteps. And, and God doesn't want it to happen. He doesn't preordain cancer or any of these things. Mm -hmm. What is interesting that, that no one who has not had any of this, who has sailed through life, they haven't been in the hospital, they haven't been at war, they haven't seen these kinds of things, and they die in their sleep at 92. You know, none of them say, God, you know, that's not, that's unjust. I, I didn't get my share of problems. You know, <laughs> you know, send me some difficulties. You know, that doesn't happen. So this is why, uh, this is one of the reasons that I wrote the current book that I have, because um, these are some experiences that I've learned only in my own life, but in the lives of others, that uh, to a large extent, you have to choose to be happy. You, you have to have an attitude that's a positive attitude, an attitude of gratitude, instead of focusing. I have to tell you just a quick story. Um, I was with a bunch of people in a beautiful hotel looking over a lake in Italy with the mountains in the lake, and I came down early for breakfast, and I'm sitting there, and these were floor to, to ceiling, ceiling to floor, picture windows, and a beautiful, perfect day, and I just happened to notice over on the side that some bird had flown over and had graced the bottom of this window. <laughs> and as much as I, I tried not to, my eyes always went to that spot. Mm -hmm. and, you know, everything, 99.44, 100% was, was beautiful, but I was looking at the negative. And I think what we need to do is choose to have a positive life. Choose to be happy. I agree with you. I think you, I, I, I have said many times in my life, you make your own happiness. And you make your own unhappiness. Right, and, and you can, can look at things. Who was it, Mark Twain, that said of all the things that he worried about throughout his life when he got older, he found out that 90% never came to fruition. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and we go through life uh, worrying about things that we have no control over. Yeah. What, do you think, what do you think it is in our culture that makes us do that? Because I don't think all cultures are like that. Well, you have to ask an anthropologist oh, to, okay. to answer that question. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know that, you know. Mm, but it, it's very true. People do tend to. I, I like the title of your book because it's living a happier life. Who, who could not want to do that? And at every age. And, and it isn't a matter of uh, you should do this in the title or you should do that or um, this is exactly the, the pattern. It's just living a happier life. I think that was a very good choice of Thank title. Um, I also liked your, your introduction. Uh, I'm not your, your, your dedication. I think you mentioned every family member <laughs> that you have. And I thought that was very sweet. That was well, very thank nice. you. Well, I think we are who we are, not just mm -hmm. you know, to a large extent uh, by people who have been significant in our lives mm -hmm. and who have demonstrated to us that they can live a happier life through all kinds of issues and problems. And as we grow up, we see that and we see them overcoming these things and living in a, a, a fulfilling life in spite of these things. And to realize that some of the most beautiful people in our lives are people that are not physically attractive. I had a grandmother that was maybe five feet tall and five feet wide. <laughs> and this was a woman that mirrored to me not only the spirit of God, but how to live and how to live a successful life. And she was not a doctor or lawyer or any of those things. 
She was just the person that, that, that uh, found the secret. My mother had an expression. She used to say, pretty is as pretty does. Right. All right. And right. we've all known people who are beautiful who, when we got to know them, were not so beautiful, and people who were not so beautiful who, when we got to know them, became right. very beautiful. Well, you know, God didn't make any junk. You know, God didn't make any... Everyone is assigned original. There are no two alike, even identical twins. That's right. So I think we need to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, good morning, gorgeous. <laughs> you know, good morning, gorgeous. <laughs> you know, God has made only one of you and to be able to celebrate that and to be able to go on with your day with that positive mindset, to be able to think not at what's just not right with your life. Every life has things that are not right with it. Mm. I mean, that, that's part of life. We all have birdie do on the window, right? We all have, yes. Uh, I don't want to use the word that I thought <laughs> at the time, but birdie do, we'll use that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the plan of the book and how we're going to lead a happier life. Without giving away everything, just give us... Well, there, there are obviously a number of chapters, and uh, anyone who's interested can go on Amazon, and they give you the first 20 pages for free, and if you yeah. like it, you buy it, and if you don't, you don't. Is it the first 20 pages? Well, oh, they, they, well they give almost 20 pages, and sometimes they skip over pages because they, don't, they want you to buy the book, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. because they make money on the book, okay? But uh, the, the, the chapters deal with things like, um, you know, why suffering? I mean, that's an age-old question. Uh, choose happiness. Um, dealing with life's hurts. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, doing the impossible. Uh, growing old gracefully you know we're all if we're lucky we're going to grow old yes right that's right you consider know? the alternative yeah i mean when a young person looks at me and says gee you're 74 years old you know oh. i said well at least i've made it there's no guarantee for you i mean yeah <laughs> i have a friend who's, a... who says i ask her how are you mary and she says i'm on the right side of the grass on the green side <laughs> right uh, yeah exactly wow. and and i think very and, and to be able to live a life that matters right to the very end I mean, don't retire. I mean, you might retire from one job, but don't retire from life. And, and make sure that the final act, you know, in a play, the final act is generally the best act. Why shouldn't it be in our lives? Why shouldn't the final act? Yeah, I uh, never could understand people who retire to nothing. Right. And, and it's many interesting. of them die very quickly. And it's interesting. I, I once had a very sad occasion. I, 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 as a clergy, I had many funerals, but this one was particularly sad because the widow was telling me that he had worked and worked in overtime and overtime, and they didn't take vacations, and they had all their life planned for them as soon as he retired. And within six months of his retirement, he dies. Mm. So we need to try to live that happier life at, at every age. You know? y yes, because we don't know how much time we have. but. Um, so tell me about the, how it was to write this book. I know that you've written all your life, all your professional life. You've been doing writing. Right. You've been writing sermons. Right. You've been writing probably articles for journals. But you right. could tell me, well, what have you been writing? Right. Well, that you're right. Up my, to my entire professional life. Um, and th this may be something of interest. Uh, and let me just say this. I think throughout college, I never got more than a C on anything I ever wrote. <laughs> so I pretty much felt this is not one of my gifts. Mm. And then I was in graduate school, and I was in a moral theology class at Union Theological Seminary with a bunch of doctoral students who were all Jesuits, who are the smart guys oh, yes, they in are. Catholicism. <laughs> And so here I am, and our grade was going to be based upon two things, our participation in the class, and secondly, our paper at the end of the class. Well, I think it was Lincoln that said, you know, you know don't open your mouth and remove all doubt of your ignorance. <laughs> and so I said nothing the whole class, so it came to writing the paper. And since I had a background in psychology, I, I wrote a paper uh, two theorists who had a different idea, Piaget and a fellow by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg, a different idea on how kids develop a moral life. Mm. And I handed in my five-page conclusion. And as I was, these were being collected, my classmates had theses that they were handing in. I almost got a hernia passing them <laughs> up to the, you know, the stage. 
And it was over the Christmas break, and this fellow who was the head, the prof who was the head of the religious education department of the, of the seminary, his secretary said he, he wanted to see me. So I think nothing good here, nothing good at all, five pages, 50 pages, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I came in, he said, Mr. Cron, I, I hope you'll forgive me. He says, but I really liked your paper. And he says, I, I gave it to a friend of mine who was the editor of the premier religious education magazine in the country, and he's gonna publish it. And it didn't take me long to forgive the guy. <laughs> all right, not, not, not at all. And uh, I, I, I didn't get an A in the class. I got an A minus because I didn't add anything to the class for the whole thing. But I thought, well, maybe, maybe there is a talent there. And then I went on a binge and I wrote a lot of things. I've probably been published in journals and professional journals and all kinds of things, maybe over 100 times. And, 30 years ago, I wrote and published about six or eight books, and then I stopped for 30 years, and now I started again in my retirement. So someone, that gentleman who you forgave, he gave you like that little seed that you need to, to tell you that you had something to say. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I would say that to anyone who thinks, why me? Or, you know, there's nothing that has encouraged me my whole life. But you know, God is not done with this, right? And, you know, until the last breath. Mm, I, you know, I, I think I I'm, I'm hoping at some point I'll be a lounge singer, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> no, I don't but, think you know, so either. <laughs> well, you've heard me sing, I guess. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, I haven't actually. Would uh, yeah. you like to? No, sing? <laughs> no, no. I don't want the people to turn off the TVs. All right. So you did all of that writing, and then what brought you to this idea? Well. Actually, the, uh, the book before this one is the one that got me started again. Uh, okay. One of my colleagues, we had a very... Surviving to yeah, thriving. We had a very interesting experience in one church that we worked at in which we could only say that God had his hands on the revival of this church. You know, mm -hmm. And uh, there was a situation in which a woman was leaving the church and I had in an announcement said that uh, we needed money, $600, to pay for something and on her way out she says to me I'll give you that six hundred dollars I had never seen her before and I said to her well wow you know thank God and she said to me I don't believe in God and it nearly knocked me off my socks no one had ever you know fully vested came out and announced to me they didn't believe in God and that week she gave a thousand dollars and I said God you have a sense of humor if you can motivate an atheist to give $1,000, I think this church is going to not close. And it didn't close. It had a remarkable turnaround. And it's just one of the stories and from surviving to thriving of the things that we did and that what God did to bring this church around to being a vital church once again. Can you, can you tell us one thing that you did? I, I don't want to give that whole thing away, but one thing you did to turn a church around? Well, we cut everybody's salaries. That wasn't too popular. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't take a salary. That was very popular mm -hmm. during the time. And uh, one of the things that we did is that I called every person in that church and introduced myself. And I said, there are two things right out of the gate that I'm going to ask you to do. And that is to commit yourself to worshiping every week. And even more importantly, and as importantly, to pray every day for this church. The same way that you would pray every day for your grandchildren, your children, your spouse, to lift up this church every day in prayer and to commit yourself to weekly worship because God desires and deserves our weekly praise. And I think that probably was one of the keys. And then during some interviews, one of the people in the church said, I'm not going to let this church fail. And I thought maybe she's a multimillionaire because they were really in financial problems, but she mm -hmm. wasn't. But she had that level of commitment. And I said to everyone there, everyone needs to have that commitment. I'm not going to allow this to happen and do what it takes. And it didn't happen. And we went from the bishop thinking that the church was going to close in four months to the, at the end of nine months, the church paid off its $45,000 debt. It had $110,000 in the bank and it had $50,000 to grow the church and a designated fund. There was another $50,000 of renovation. All this in nine months. And this is what God and God's miracles can do if people really trust and believe you know, in their mm -hmm. church, no matter what denomination. No matter what, I mean, it's, it's not 
God's just not the, the God of Lutherans, whom I happen to be, but of all <laughs> of his people. I have a funny joke, but <laughs> I have to tell you. Okay. Okay, so I, I'll turn it to Lutherans. Okay, okay, so this man dies, and he goes to heaven, and, and St. Peter gives a tour, okay, and because there are different rooms, different mansions in my house, is that the mm -hmm, quote? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they open one door, and um, the man looks in, and, and the tour guide, St. Peter says, that's the Jewish those are the, that's Jewish heaven, and the people are dancing the horror, and they're having just a grand time. And they close the door, and they go to the next one, and um, they open the door, and um, here we are in the mosque with the seven virgins and all mm -hmm. of the wonderful things that Muslim heaven gives us. And so Ben says, okay, and closes the door. And he says, what's behind that door? And he says, oh, those are the Lutherans. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> there are others? <laughs> I love that joke. I, I think it, because I like usually it when I tell it, yeah. it's the Catholics I, I like who think it. they're yeah. the only ones. Yeah. Yeah. And some of my uh, Lutheran friends probably believe that's true. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, but that's the problem with religions, isn't it? Well, I think I think it's I think it's quite right to think whatever you believe is the truth. Uh, why believe it in that way if you don't feel it? But I think it's quite arrogant to think that when we get to heaven. That, that God's going to say everybody else is going to be judged based upon the way the Lutherans are. We're mm -hmm. all going to find that we're sinners and that we didn't perceive everything of God correctly. No, I, have a, I have a friend who says, aren't we all headed to the same place? All of us in the different religions, aren't we all trying well, to find a moral compass to make it to um, the yeah. afterlife, whatever yeah. it might be, so, or I whatever it is? I think all religions have that in common. Yeah, so why are we fighting with one another? Well, that's not needed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I think that I know how to be happy. Well, I, I'm sure you are a happy person, but who among <laughs> us couldn't be happier? And I think in this book, without pitching it too hard, is that there are any number of things that as people have read it and they've come to me and said, Gee, I haven't quite thought of it that way. Mm. Uh, I, you know, maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, what you meant.